Kathy Wood's ARC funds invest in disruptive technology. They try to find the trends which will shape our lives in the decades ahead, and they find the companies which they think will be at the forefront of those changes. And they themselves have been quite disruptive because they've been so successful. They've generated massive returns and they've also attracted massive inflows and expanded as a result. But the question has to be asked, when equity markets suffer a correction, what will that mean for ARK funds? And will ARK themselves amplify that downturn? So remember, if you do want to learn more about this topic and also how to invest more generally, a great way to do that is as part of our Patreon community. If you support us, you'll get access to lots of exclusive videos and our chat application Slack, where you can talk to me and other members of the community. There'll be a link in the description below me and beside me so you can learn more. So let's look at ARC in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice, tell it to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Let's start off with what I like about ARC. Probably what I like best about ARC is Kathy Wood, who's the CIO and founder of the company. And both she and her team have been incredibly successful at finding companies which are at the forefront of these changes in our lives driven by technology. What I also love is their transparency. You just go to their website and you can dig into any of their research themes in as much detail as you can possibly stomach. It used to be the case that only professional investors could get this kind of research from investment banks. But I think ARK Invest have really changed that. They try and bring along all of their investors with them in terms of their investment themes. And I think that's probably the way forward for active management in future. And this is their big ideas report, which I think they update every year, which goes through all of the themes which they use to drive their investment process. And it really goes into quite a lot of detail for each of these themes and the companies which they think will be at the forefront of those themes. And you may have seen a review I did of the main ARC funds, and there should be a link available in case you have missed that. Well, if ARC is so great, then what's the problem? I think the primary problem they're now facing is the scaling problem. Beneath me here, you can see that they've got 60 billion in assets under management, but that follows a period of explosive growth. In fact, over 60% of that growth came in just the last three years. And half of that growth came in the last six months during this huge rally that we've seen in the particular stocks which they favour. The reason why that's a problem is that big funds have difficulty buying small stocks. If you look at Warren Buffett's funds, for example, they can't even touch even mid-cap stocks because if they did, a meaningful allocation would end up owning a very large proportion of an entire company. And where does most growth come from? It comes from the smaller, less liquid stocks. So as fund management companies scale, somehow these stocks go out of reach. They're simply too small to deal with in a meaningful way. So how big is ARK now? Well, if we compare it with some of the monsters of the US fund management industry, like iShares, Vanguard, and so on, it's still absolutely tiny by comparison. You can see ARK here at the bottom in bright yellow, whereas monster fund managers like BlackRock have over 2 trillion in assets under management, and Vanguard is comparable. It's not far off 2 trillion itself. But if we zoom in on the smaller funds, which are at the bottom of that list, you can see that ARK went from 20th biggest issuer to 7th in just one year. And it's overtaken fund managers like Van Eck, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, ProShares, PIMCO, Fidelity. And just look at the rate of growth. It's still got a long way to go to get to number 6, which is First Trust, as Eric Balchuna says here. But at this rate of growth, if it continues, it's not going to be very long before it gets there. So now that it's playing with the big kids, there's a problem and the problem is liquidity. And that's illustrated nicely by this tweet, I think. And it shows this crowded room on the left here, and that represents a crowded trade, where many people are buying the same stock. Now, if that stock itself is a fairly small company, then the liquidity, which is the ability to buy and sell the stock very quickly and cheaply, is limited. Now, that's not a problem while we're in a good set of market conditions as equity prices rise, but when markets start to turn south, we start to think about exiting the trade. And the question comes to mind, how big is the door 
that we all have to get out of. If the trading volume is typically very small, then someone who has a very large position could take many days to close out their position, if they can close it out at all. Liquidity is never an issue until you need it, and that tends to happen during a crisis. And the problem is that ARK is now quite big, so it currently owns more than 10% of 25 companies in which it invests. And if you want to see the market news that we think is important, such as this tweet from Nate Jirasi, then you can always follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at PensionCraft. And if we blow up that table, you can see that in some cases, it owns about a fifth of the fund. For example, Compugen, Stratasys, and Organovo Holdings. Now, while this is happening, in other words, the stocks that it's bought have gone up, that's not a problem. In fact, buying an illiquid small stock will actually make the price of the stock go up a lot. The fact that Cathy Wood buys a small company shows faith in that company. And that's enough to get a lot of other buyers buying into the same theme. After all, they can just read her research and many investors will probably agree with ARK Invest's conclusions. So what we see currently is this very positive feedback cycle. ARK Invest buys a big stake in a small, innovative company, other people get on board with a trade and the share price simply goes vertical. And you can see the effect of that positive feedback loop with returns of over 300% during this pandemania period. But what's going to happen when we see a 2008 type of scenario where people are taking risk off the table? I'm not saying that's going to happen imminently, but we all know it's going to happen eventually. Well, suddenly the feedback goes into reverse. All those retail investors, which have also been buying the same stocks as ARK Invest, will suffer a sharp reduction in risk appetite. It can be very scary if you've never seen a bear market before. And as those stocks start to fall, I suspect we're going to see very sharp outflows from ARK Invest itself. And whenever you get a forced seller of stock, particularly small illiquid stocks, the price impact can be quite severe. To see how that might work, it's interesting to look at the plumbing behind exchange traded funds. So let's say that this is you, and you hold one share of ARK K. And let's say that you're panicking and you want to sell it. Well, you'd sell that to your broker, and in return, they'd hand over some money. But notice the letters AP on your broker. What well, that stands for is authorized participant. This is because their job is to actually create units of the fund. Now, an exchange traded fund is an open ended fund. If lots of people buy into the fund, the size of the fund increases and more units are created. If people are selling the fund, the number of fund units shrinks through a process called redemption. And it's a job of these authorised participants to create and redeem these units. In return, they get to do these juicy arbitrage trades where they can make an almost risk-free profit if the price of the ETF is different from the stocks within the ETF. After you've sold your share to the authorised participant, who's also your broker, you've got dollars in your hand and you're done. However, your broker is now long ARC. They own a share of ARC themselves. Now, a broker's job is not to take directional bets on funds going up or down. It's their job to make money on the difference between the buying and selling price. So the risk department at the broker will be smacking this authorised participant over the head, telling them to lose their long position. The broker must end the day flat. They don't want to have any directional bet on whether ARK goes up or down. So they have to get rid of this long position. They can do that by shorting a basket of stocks, which are the stocks owned by the fund. Those are called in-kindable stocks. If ARK goes up in value, the price of the basket will go down in value and counteract the shift. And if ARK goes down in value, the short basket will go up in value. What they do next is trigger something called a redemption, and they do that with ARK itself. They deliver their ARK K ETF to ARK, which then gives them the basket of stocks which they were short, and then they can close out their short position. Well, how about ARK? Well, because they've redeemed that one unit of ARK, the size of the fund is now smaller. It's shrunk by one unit. Of course, they don't usually do this in one share units. It's usually bundled up into trades of about 50,000 ETF stocks. But this is the process, this creation and redemption process, which keeps the price of the ETF in line with the price of the stocks inside it. 
If you read the prospectus for ARC funds, you'll see several comments about this creation redemption process. And one of the risks which the prospectus points out is that during periods of extreme market volatility or potential lack of an active trading market for shares, yes, that means illiquidity, then the fund's price could trade at a significant discount or premium to the net asset value of the stocks inside the fund. And if a shareholder purchases the shares when the market price is at a premium to the NAV or sells when it's at a discount to the NAV, they may sustain losses. So during these periods of market disruption, when the authorised participant can't actually short the basket of stocks, you get this discrepancy between the price of the fund and its net asset value. Or perhaps a simpler way to think about this is that if people are pulling their money out of the fund, then the fund has to go out and sell the assets inside the fund. But if it's going to take a long time to sell those shares, people may be selling the fund faster than ARK can sell the stocks inside the basket. And people sometimes call that a liquidity mismatch. You can sell the fund faster than you can sell some of the stocks inside the fund. Now in the UK, there's a very similar episode which all of us would rather forget, and it's to do with Neil Woodford. Now in 2013, Neil Woodford was the star of stars in the firmament of UK active fund managers. In fact, he was so good that he got a CBE, which means he's a commander of the Order of the British Empire. And that was for services to the economy. And it truly seemed like this guy was our Warren Buffett. When he worked at Invesco, he headed up this perpetual income fund for a period of over two decades. And his returns are shown here in blue versus the sector average in red. His average performance was about 12% versus just under 8% for the rest of the sector. And in fact, he was so successful, he went off to start his own Woodford Fund. And there was a huge amount of breathless praise in the media and from platforms like Hargreaves Lansdowne in the UK, which fed the fervour for people to give him their money. And consequently, money poured into these Woodford funds. Now, the warning sign was a kind of stocks in which he was investing. So this equity income fund, for example, was mainly invested in UK stock market listed companies, in other words, they trade on the London Stock Exchange, but it could also invest up to 10% of the fund in small emerging companies. And in fact, they're so small that they were unlisted. They weren't listed on the stock market. And consequently, they were very illiquid. Now, this was an open-ended fund. Remember, these can grow and shrink according to popularity, which means that if money floods out, then they have to sell the stocks. Would that be a problem? I don't think I'm giving the game away by saying, it was. In fact, he also had a closed capital fund called Patient Capital that also underperformed, but it didn't have this liquidity problem. That's because an investment trust has a fixed amount of capital and the fund never has to shrink or expand as its popularity wanes and waxes. But consequently, what happened was that the fund underperformed. And not only did retail investors, that small investors like you and I, pull out their money, institutional investors who trusted Woodford to manage their clients' money pulled out as well. A huge fund manager called Jupiter pulled out 300 million in October 2017. And the following month, another institutional manager, Aviva, pulled out another 30 million. But the real shock came in June 2019. Woodford announced that the fund would have to be gated. In other words, if you were an investor, you couldn't pull out your money. You might be seeing the value of the fund fall, but there's nothing you could do about it. You can probably imagine there was a huge amount of anger. Why did the fund have to be gated? Well, we see that in the following paragraph. Following an increased level of redemptions, in other words, people pulling out their money, this period of suspension was supposed to protect the investors in the fund by allowing Woodford time to reposition in more liquid stocks. So he'd have longer to take these unquoted, low liquidity stocks, sell them slowly and replace them with more liquid investments, which traded on an exchange. And it wasn't just retail investors who were upset by this. Kent County Council, a local government council, had invested over £260 million with Woodford. And it wasn't allowed to withdraw its money once the fund was gated. And you can see some classic British understatement here, where a spokesman for the council said that the gating decision was disappointing. So that's what happened in the UK. But the question is, could we see Cathy doing a Woodford? This table underneath me 
of a listing of stocks owned by ARK K in the middle of February in 2021. And the ninth biggest holding is a company called Invite. Now that's only 3% of the ARK K fund, which doesn't sound like much, but unfortunately Invite is a very small company. And that's where the problem starts. If you go to the NASDAQ website, you can see the average traded volume in numbers of shares for every stock which is traded on the exchange. In the case of Invite, that's just over 3 million stocks per day. Now ARK's holding of Invite is about 17 million stocks. So each of these little red blocks is a million stocks owned by ARK. But the normal daily volume in Invite stocks is only 3 million stocks. So assuming that they trade the normal number of shares in a given day, it would take just under six days to sell that holding. Now that's not a problem while money's coming into the fund. In fact, it actually helps the fund because a very large fund buying this very illiquid stock is going to push up the price. But when things go into reverse, it's going to be a very bad story for Invite and other stocks owned by ARK which have a fairly small market cap and also a small daily traded volume. So if I repeat that exercise for all of the stocks where I have volume data in ARK K and I sort by the number of days to sell their position, these are the stocks where it would take more than four days, assuming a normal market volume, in order to sell the entire position. Now, of course, ARK wouldn't have to do that. They wouldn't have to sell the entire position, just some fraction of it, according to how much money had flowed out of their fund. But what you have to ask yourself is who would be taking the other side of that trade? And you can bet that market makers would mark down the price of those stocks very significantly. But I think this could actually be a broader problem, one of contagion. So what I've plotted here is the number of days to sell the entire position for each of the ARK holdings. These are based on volumes I got from SharePad, so I'm not completely convinced that the volumes are correct. But what it does do is to give you an idea of the least liquid holdings for ARK K. Now what usually happens when you get outflows is that an active manager can choose to sell the more liquid stocks rather than the less liquid stocks. So let's say there was a massive outflow from one of these ARK funds. The problem is that the fund manager can't sell the illiquid stuff, or at least not quickly enough to meet the redemptions. So instead of selling those stocks, you sell these stocks. These are the ones which are a bit more liquid. So that would be companies like CRISPR Therapeutics or Teladoc Health or Zillow or Spotify. And that's typically how contagion happens. So for example, in Silver Thursday, the sell-offs in the silver market spread to other markets because hedge funds couldn't sell their silver. So instead they sold their other assets which were more liquid. And we often see this with the emerging market currency crises. The less liquid currencies are more difficult to sell. So unfortunately the Mexican peso, which is the most liquid emerging market currency, is the one who usually gets whacked. Now I'm not saying that ARK is going to have to gate these funds. That's very unlikely. But what I think is pretty clear is that they have fairly chunky positions in fairly illiquid stocks. And as we saw in the case of Woodford in the UK, that can cause severe market disruptions when people are taking risk off the table. So I hope you found that video interesting and useful. And remember, you can now support us directly. You don't have to go to Patreon. You can do it directly here on YouTube. If you do support us on YouTube, then you get a beautifully designed icon in the shape of a pension craft crown next to your name. And that way, if we do a YouTube live, we'll know you're one of our supporters and we'll push you to the front of the queue to answer your question first. And as always, thank you for listening.